So have you fallen down an Ethereum hole? Or are you getting really interested in potentially owning a few more Ethereums? Stick around and I'll basically tell you everything I've learned over the years for caring for all different types of Ethereums. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So this is a video that a lot of people have requested over the months and years basically that I've had the channel, which is, can you tell us a bit more about Ethereum's and kind of the care that you give to your Ethereum's and what you've learned over the years? And I delayed making this video for multiple reasons. One, the predominant reason is I didn't own Anthuriums or specifically some of the more tricky Anthuriums for a very long period of time. And the ones that I did, I mean, at this point, people that have been here for a while will know that I have killed my fair share of Clarinerviums, which is the first of the more uncommon type of Anthuriums, not the Anthurium andrianum. which I'll put a picture here, which is the one where people buy it in the supermarkets because of the colorful flower, although it's technically not the bloom that's colorful, it's bracked. So, but yeah, it was, I couldn't even keep a Clarinervium happy. So I'm just like, I can't talk from any level of authority or experience about keeping Anthuriums happy. I have since got a lot of Anthuriums and have been able to keep them happy, propagate them as well, and also attempt to grow something like hybrid Anthurium. So this is an Anthurium Zara X Michelle. And before we get on, there's a little surprise video. Hey, this is an extra little segment to today's video. And it's kind of a bit of a mini little exciting unboxing. I got an amazing plant from the Botany Bros in the UK. And the really exciting thing is that you could also have a chance to win the same plant as long as you are based within mainland UK, basically. So this is for all the UK peeps. But without further ado, shall we look at what I got? Okay, so a little bitty box. Obviously, I've taken off my details because internet. <laughs> so let's have a look. Quite a sturdy box. Came with next day delivery. And this should be a really interesting one. I have had my eye on this plant for a while. And for those that might not be aware, the Botany Bros are two lovely human beings that are based here in the UK. And they are Matt and Mark. And they started Botany Bros, I think, 2022? 2021. Because they really liked and talking and taking care of Anthurium specifically. So they are a specialist in Anthuriums. And like a lot of people out there, they wanted it to start off as a small business. So they've got a bit more control on the quality of the plants that they send out. And basically from everybody that I know that has ever got any plants from Botany Bros, they have kind of stuck to that really, really well. Everybody usually, from what I've been able to see at least, has got great things to say, not only about the plants, but about the packaging, about the, them sending out the plants as well. So, and they are exceptionally knowledgeable. So really, really quite cool. When they first started off, they started off as a Facebook group. <laughs> but in 2023, I think this year, they've started off their own websites, the Botany Bros website. So I will put it at the top there. And I will link it down below in the description as well. The interesting thing with this, because I was talking to both of them, actually, both Matt and Mark, and the way that they run their business is essentially if these are the plants, they would select the plants that they would be happy to get themselves as well. So that is saying something as well, especially if it's like Anthurium enthusiasts. You can sometimes get Anthuriums that are a bit like, oh, I got a bit of a dud one. So this is really good to see that there is that extra bit of thought that goes into the plants before they come out to you, basically. And even though they do specialize in Anthuriums, it's not just Anthuriums. They've got a whole selection of other tropicals as well, if I'm not mistaken. Check out their website and their Instagram as well. So back to the box. <laughs> so that was a bit of an intro for the people that might have not been aware of them as a company. So very good. I like I think we're all kind of getting used to this type of packaging now where 
Things are attached to the box so they don't move around. And it means that the plants come to us a bit more secure. Oh, very, very secure. So a ah, bit of corrugated paper, cardboard, yes. And let's have a look. Let's have a look. Oh, oh, larger than I thought it was going to be because essentially it's a seedling, but very well packaged as we all tend to know with these things. So that's a quick peek. So uh, let me get this uh, disentangled from here and we can look at it a bit closer as well. And I can already see the roots and they are spectacular. And it's a decent seedling size as well. So I think this is, this is what comes into play when they say that this is the kind of plants that they would send out. Because a lot of the times you get people that might be selling seedlings and they sell very, very young seedlings. This is a bit more of an established seedling, basically. So let me bring it up and let me actually take off. And it's wrapped in a cling film as well, just in order to keep that humidity in. Let me uh, take most of this off. I love these packagings because it means that the plants are really secure. They to unbox. Give me a sec. To be honest, I would much rather it be a pain to unbox and the plant comes to me safely than the other way around, basically. So really easy to unbox, but then the plant comes to you in bits. So <laughs> this is a good thing. So, ooh, very nice. Oh, look at that rutage. Can you see it there if I kind of hide my face? Very, very cool. Very good roots. It is in sphagnum moss and prolite from what I can see, but yeah, very healthy roots. You might be able to see on that newest leaf, if I hide my face, what the big deal is about this specific hybrid. And I don't know if I've mentioned the hybrid yet. <laughs> this is the Zara X Michelle or the Michelle X Zara. I can't remember which one of the which way it goes round. I will add it at the top there. But very, very, very cool. They have done all their kind of proper due diligence with passport, plant passports and things like that. So that's really good. But very good and very impressive kind of robust feeling plant, which is really, really cool. So shall we talk a bit more about the plant itself? Because a lot of people know you might see some of the hybrids of Zara X Michelle coming up, but I don't know whether or not a lot of people know some of the background. So I've done a bit of the research so you don't have to. So this is the interesting thing. So the two parent plants, are actually plants, and I think the Zara X Michelle, and I think it is that way around, is across the dock block did in the US originally. And it's, I think the Botany Bros, the Botany Bros have got like a kind of working relationship with dock block basically. So they probably got the plants originally from there basically. So the way that the Botany Bros have done this, and I'm kind of taking this information from their website is that the way that they breed the seedlings is from their premium specimens that they've got already of Zara, Zara, Zara X Michelle plants that they've got themselves in their collection base. And they do believe, and I think I kind of agree with them now that I've seen this, because I could see a lot of it being discussed online. And now I kind of get the hype because they're saying, and I'm kind of looking down because I've got notes here. They believe that the particular variety stands out as one of the finest options for those seeking a bit of vibrancy and a bit of redness on the leaves. And hopefully that's being picked up. Probably made the mistake of wearing something red, but you should be able to see some blushing that's happening there in the veination of the foliage. And the way that they've got this on their website as well is that it's the grower's select choice, basically. So this is what I mean. They go in and select some of the best specimens to send out rather than just send out everything basically, which is admirable because a lot of companies probably wouldn't do that. So the characteristics of the hybrid itself is the Anserum Zara. And again, this is this is corroborated with Doc Block's website as well. And Doc Block's website, which I will also link down below, has got the registration with the International Arid Society for both parent plants. And I'll talk about the parent plants in just a moment. But Essentially, the cross is known for striking red petioles, and I would agree, some very interesting red petioles there. There's also red spadix, and the leaf comes in 
and emerges as a burgundy color, which is kind of cool because you don't see that very, very often. I know a lot of the Anthuriums, they do come out in really cool colors. So this will be, I'm looking forward because the newest leaf has kind of already started going green on this. I'm looking forward to the next leaf so I can see the color when it comes in properly. The Michelle part of it is really interesting as well. So it displays violet petioles and spadix as well and violet to burgundy emerging leaves. So the Zara's got red to burgundy, this has got violet to burgundy emerging leaves. And they do actually come up in a really interesting combination because the way that the petioles are and the way that I would imagine the leaves would come off, so it's not coming up that well on the video, but actually there is a slight kind of leftover of that ready burgundy, possibly purpliness in kind of a bit of a pink cast on that newest leaf, which is really cool. So looking at the information from the Doc Block website, so looking at the Zara parent, it's basically saying that the seed parent is Anthurium magnificum. And this is interesting because when I was first looking at this hybrid, I'm just like, oh, there's obviously like a hybrid of two different types of crystallinums. And keep that in mind, but the seed parent is an Anthurium magnificum for the Zara. And the pollen parent is unnamed cultivar of a crystallinum, which showed those kind of red leaves coming through. And then you get the Zara with the kind of red pones coming through. So interestingly, the Michelle is a cultivar of the Magnificum again. So this is where you kind of get that. And that's why I'm kind of really impressed with the structure of these leaves are actually quite Purged. There's also a tiny bit of velvetiness, I would say, on this. So that should be interesting. And it's interesting because, and I don't know whether or not a lot of people know this, but apparently, and I thought this was kind of cute, Michelle was given to the name of the plant, so the, the Michelle part of the parentage is because Michelle is the name, and it says here on the certification from the International Aroid Society is the name of the originator's wife. So I'm assuming Doc Block's wife is called Michelle, which is really cute because immortalized in one of the plants, basically, that he's kind of worked on. And this is the one that has got the violet petiole and spadix and the emerging leaf is one that's a bit more violet and burgundy as well. So very, very, very cool. So after that unboxing, which I thought was going to be quick, but looking at the time now, this is after a substantial unboxing, I wanted to say a bit more about the plant, basically. So yeah, Meh. but coming on to the truly exciting bit for all of you out there now, there will be a competition. I don't know when this video is going to come out but next week. And by next week, I mean from the 2nd of October until the 8th of October, if I'm not mistaken, I'll add the dates up there and it will be on my Instagram account. So again, I will add it at the top there. So a lot of you probably already follow me on Instagram, but you will find it there. You've probably already seen it for the ones who haven't. That would be the place to check it. And it's an Instagram competition. So go like, follow, make sure that you're following everybody. You can share it on your stories. You can tag any of your friends on there for extra entries. And on the Sunday, the 8th in the evening, I will, doing, I will be doing the draw and selecting a winner. And the plant will be coming directly from botany bros so get excited this is very very cool plant i cannot tell you how interesting it is just by looking at it here basically but i'll also have some close-up pictures as well on my instagram so you should be able to see it on there as well yeah hopefully you've enjoyed now back to the regular content so now that i've got you back let's keep talking about anthuriums in general basically so People might be able to tell, I mean, this is an Anthurium crystallinum. It's a propagation. I am growing it in semi-hydro. And you can see some of the roots right down there below. So they are quite chunky roots. So what is an Anthurium essentially? Anthurium is a tropical plant, as you might have guessed. And it is part of the Aroid family of plants. So when it does grow it grows when it grows a bloom or an inflorescence it's very similar to most aroids where it's got the spadix and the spathe and all of these things and the challenge with anthurium sometimes is that they are not the most straightforward when you're first starting off to care for at least for these types of anthuriums i'm not talking about the anthurium andrianum as i've mentioned those are the ones you can get in the supermarket even those can be challenging at times 
And why is that? Because amphiriums are very specific about their care, specifically not just necessarily higher levels of humidity, they don't always need higher levels of humidity, but specifically what they're grown in. Because amphiriums are those plants that want their cake and they want to eat it too. So they want as much air circulation of movement around their roots, but they also want to be constantly moist. <laughs> Which obviously you can imagine that in the environment that these plants would grow naturally in, that's an easy task to accomplish because they're growing in a rainforest. There's usually quite high levels of humidity. They're growing either on the side of trees or down below on the, so either epiphytically, so against the tree, or terrestrially, which will be down in the soil level. But if you've ever seen a jungle floor level in the forest, you would imagine that there's a lot of leaf debris, all of these things. It's actually quite airy, but again, that moisture is still there. This does make them a bit challenging when it comes to growing them in a household environment, however. But before we kind of dive into the more nitty gritty, let's do a quick anatomy lesson or kind of overview, basically. So you've usually got the growing stem. You will usually have a point here where the next bloom or inflorescence will come from. Then you've got the petiole of the actual plant itself. It's also got the attachment. I can remember what the attachment is, if I'll find it and put it at the top there. And then you've got the leaf itself. Now, anthuriums are those types of plants that can have loads of different ways of appearing. And by that, I mean that they can appear to be different in their structure, not just the heart-shaped leaves, but if I bring this anthurium down, you might be able to see. So this is the anthurium erismoides. It's got multiple leaflets on the actual specific petiole. So these, each one of these is one leaf. It's not three leaves. So that is one type of anthurium. Then you've got anthuriums, and I don't have one to show you because I've never owned an anthurium, but like a bird's nest anthurium. And those are the ones that are more resembling bird nest anthuriums. And then if I show you here, so this is the queen anthurium. This is more strappy leaved. This is also more velvety. And if you come over to this side as well, and I will see if I can pull it down without destroying the whole plant, you've also got something like the anthurium vichii, the king anthurium, which again is more kind of strappy leaved and it will get even longer. It's got ruffles on the leaves. But this is quite leathery. So there is that to be said. You've also got other anthurium types here, like the Vitarifolium, which are strappy leaves. They leave, the leaves look like belts, basically. And these are only just a few examples of how anthuriums can be quite different in their structure. I will show you another anthurium leaf here. And this is the Anthurium esmeraldense, which is very similar to the Philodendron esmeraldense, which is right next to it. But you can see that there is a huge variety of structures and morphology to a lot of these Anthuriums. The one thing that a lot of people, when they talk about Anthuriums, don't always talk about, if at all, in depth, basically, is Anthurium sections. So before you watch the rest of this video, go down in the comments below and tell me, have you heard of what is, what they, what anthurium sections are basically? Let me know down below. Okay, cool. So hopefully for the people that know, this might be a bit of a refresher, but for the people that don't know, essentially botanists have sectioned off different anthuriums into different sections or groupings. And it's not always to do with the leaf shape. It might be other morphological reasons for these anthuriums being placed into sections. I will kind of go through a few of them, but I will leave the full list down below, the ones that I could find. This is an ever evolving list, so things might change. My information that I found might not be as up to date as something else, but if you do know something slightly different, do let us know in the comments below. So, sections for anthuriums. So, there are quite a few. I think there's 18 or 19. Or 19. So you've got the polyphylum. I've got an iPad because I'm not going to remember this off the top of my head. The gymnopodium, the urospadix, the 
Cialophyllum, the Calomystrium, the Cardiolochium, the Tetraspermium, the Pachinarium. There's a whole host of sections. And a lot of these plants are kind of grouped together. So for instance, the Cardiolochium has got the Anthurium Warraquinum or the Queen Anthurium. Car Cardiolochium Socardia in Greek, which I'm assuming is part of the reason why the name is there, is hot. So I would wonder if the Cardiolochium is because it might look like heart-shaped leaves. I'm not entirely sure. I will double check on the crystallinum, but I think the crystallinum is part of the cardiolochium. Now, you might say, okay, so why do we need to be aware of sections? This is maybe a bit of an advanced topic. Possibly and possibly not. There are good reasons to be aware of sections. Sections specifically will be really useful to you when you're looking at doing something like anthurium pollination. So for instance, say you've got an anthurium and it's in bloom and you want to cross-pollinate it with a different anthurium. Now, sections is when it comes, it becomes really important that you're kind of aware of what section both parent plants are from because a lot of the times sections cross-sectional pollination. So let me bring you an example again. So the cardiolochium that we were talking about before is one of the sections and then maybe looking at the tetraspermium section as well. So trying to hybridize a cardiolochium and a tetraspermium, I'm not saying that's definitely where these two would sit in terms of sections, might not work. And what does that mean? It might mean that either the, the berries that will come out after you've done the pollination, and I have done a video about pollinating anthuriums when I did mine, and I had no clue about this, so I'm surprised that I actually got some plantlets from it. It might come up with berries that have got no seed, which means it's infertile. So the cross happened, in a sense, but there's no viable offspring from that cross because those sections differ too, too much between the two of them. I think a lot of the times, if you are cross-hybridizing between the same section, so maybe two plants from the cardiolochium section, you should be okay. The, the genetics are similar enough that you should get viable seedlings. Again, it's not always 100% that that will be the case because what might also happen then is you might not get as many seeds or the seeds might grow, but they might grow really slowly and they're kind of developmentally challenged, if that makes sense. So there is these things that you need to be aware of. So if you do want to go down the anthurium pollination route, rather than just doing a traditional kind of propagation, which it would be cutting the chunk, making sure there's an aerial root, and then propagating it out so that aerial root will grow proper roots to then get a secondary plant. If you want to go down the pollination route, I would highly suggest you look into sections and you look into the sections that your two plants are. Because, and I had a lot of people that were asking me questions about this probably in the last year, kind of saying, well, I've done this cross and this cross and I didn't know about sections at that point. And I was just like, why is it not working or why hasn't it happened? And it could just be an error in the process, but it could also be the fact that the sections are too different and you would have never got viable kind of fertilization because what you might do is if you're cross-pollinating, you might get, as I said, the berries without the seeds. So that is an infertile kind of cross. I think that's essentially what that would be. You might not even get berries and you might say, oh, I didn't do the pollination properly. You probably did the, maybe did the pollination okay, but it would have never have taken enough to create the berries anyway. So <laughs> there are these things to remember as well. And I'll bring up the hybrid that I was talking about before, the Zara X Michelle hybrid. And I didn't know necessarily which, what the parents were of this plant until I went onto Dot Block's website, who I think was the original creator of this hybrid, who mentions the parentage of the Anthurium Zara and the Anthurium Michelle. And it shows that both of these plants, so both the Zara and the Michelle, one of each of their parents was a Magnificum, if I'm not mistaken. And there might have been some Crystallinum in there as well. So I'm assuming even the 
the plant parents that created the Zara and the plant parents that created the Michelle, those sections would have had to be favorable within themselves to create that. And obviously, when that was created, hybridizing those two, if the parentage was quite similar, then you would get this. Because again, you're thinking this is a hybrid of hybrids. So there is that that you need to kind of, and it really does start playing a part at that point. I know I've probably lost a few of you at this point. I probably will look at this in editing and maybe give a bit of a warning before this section if somebody's really just starting off and this might be a bit overwhelming so you can skip to the next topic. But for the people that have been doing this for a while, sections are something that you really should dive into. As I said, I will add a couple of links in terms of resources that I found down below. One image specifically, which has groupings and I'll give you the list that I found of the 18 or 19 sections. There's that many, basically. Not every single one of them will have multiple plants in them. Some of them might only have a few plants in, but some of them have a lot of plants in. So <laughs> bear that in mind. Now, care tips for each one of the different anthuriums. And this is a section where I would say you need to do your research on the native environment of some of these anthuriums. So for instance, check out if you want to own a queen anthurium, have a look and see where it natively grows. Specifically, have a look at things like average rainfall in a year. And I know this is going to get really specific, but average rainfall in a year, what the climate is like, what the elevation level is like as well, because that is going to make a difference essentially. So if it's higher elevation, and I will show you a plant that has got its origins from higher elevations, and I will bring it and show it in without dropping everything, hopefully. There we go. Which is the Anthurium cuticuense, basically. So the Anthurium cuticuense is from a higher elevation. That's the predominant reason why people might struggle to grow that specific Anthurium well. And the reason for that is essentially that because it's from a higher elevation, and this is how you can start reading into the research that you're going to do about their natural habitat, so if it's from a higher elevation, it will be used to some slightly higher temperatures. If it's in a cloud forest, it's used to very, very high levels of humidity. Because if you'd imagine those, that part of where the plant is growing would probably always have some level of mist. So the humidity might be very close to 100%. But also if it's very high elevation, it probably experiences a significant drop in temperature between daytime temperature and nighttime temperatures. Again, cast your mind back, say you're going up a mountain in the middle of the summer. If you're at the very top of that mountain and it's blisteringly hot down below on kind of sea level, up there it might be even hotter because you are that much closer to the sun. But conversely, at nighttime, that very tip of that mountain might get very, very chilly in relation to what it might be at sea level. So these are things that you need to really start considering. And again, as I said, anthuriums, when you start moving in that direction, you are taking a step up in your care. It's not your average philodendron. It's not your average monstera, which might be a bit more forgiving. Some anthuriums can be forgiving. And I would say maybe start with those. And I'm not going to bore you with giving specific, too many specific examples because everybody has done this already, but your clarinerviums, your crystallinums, all of these things. I would even say the vitarifolium behind me, that's a nice easy one. Start there, basically. So that's the one thing. Do your research as to where these plants are coming from. The other thing is if you find videos like the ones that I'm making online or other articles specifically about your anthurium. And there's a lot of online sections, articles, blogs about specific anthuriums. And if you read them, I'm just like, ah, so your advice is the same as every other anthurium. Okay then. Yeah. Um, but just Try and see if you can go in a bit deeper, basically. Don't just go on one or two articles that you find. Have a look. See if you can find discussions either on YouTube videos, possibly on Reddit as well. You might do the dreaded Facebooks as an option as well if you can actually talk to people that are growing your specific Anthurium and see their feedback on your specific Anthuriums. The reason why I'm holding this Anthurium Microspadix, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, Microspadix. Never remember the name of this plant is because unlike a lot of anthuriums, it's got very small leaves. They are very strap-like. This is a mature specimen, by the way. 
but it's called a micro spadix because you might be able to see the bloom there is itty bitty tiny whiny. So if you want a small anthurium, this might be a good option for you. That one's been relatively easy, actually, and I will thank Jacob from Grow Tropicals because he suggested that when I went to see him at the event that they did last year up in Leeds. But do your research. Also have a look at the morphology of your plant. And I'm trying to think and see if I might be able to show you. I'll see if I can add a picture because I can't. It's not easy for me to move the camera. This specific anthurium, so the anthurium vitarifolium, the roots are chunky. Very, very, very chunky. So if you've got um, Balanopsis orchid and you've seen those very, very chunky roots, that's very similar. Guess what? That plant can store a lot of water in those roots, which means that unlike a lot of anthuriums that might be a bit more delicate, the Vitarifolium not only doesn't mind going dry, I find that it prefers to have a tiny bit of a dry period before rewatering, basically. So have a look at that. So conversely, if your anthurium, you're seeing it and the roots are very, very fine, it might need a lot more water. So for instance, the cuticuensis that we were talking about before, the, the roots are very, very fine because it's not had to develop thicker roots, because if it's up in the cloud forest and high elevations, it's usually got a lot of moisture around it. Why would you need thicker roots to store water? The water is always available to you. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, when you're looking at things like fertilizers for your anthuriums, is making sure that, for instance, that you're getting a lot of, I think it's CalMag, so calcium and magnesium for your anthuriums. It does help with some of those darker foliage as well. A lot of people will see anthuriums and get really worried, and I'll bring you up one so you can see it here, when they start getting imperfections in the leaves. Now, I'm gonna burst your bubble really, really hard here and just kind of say, this is how this plant came to me, but this is a leaf that I babied all the way out and it still has blemishes. The thinner the anthurium leaf, and it's not even that, like a thin anthurium leaf is fine. The, all the damage that your plant will get a lot of the times with anthurium, same thing goes with pests, is when the leaf is emerging. After the leaf has fully, fully hardened off, even the thinner leaved anthuriums, most pest damage isn't going to be that substantial because it's quite a thick leaf, and most tears have already happened when it was very, very young. So, there is that kind of edict when you've got anybody who's been growing anthuriums for a long enough time and there's a new leaf that's emerging, you kind of go near it. If somebody's around and they're going to near it, they just say, don't breathe on that leaf wrong because it might tear. Same thing goes that maybe try not to be so specific. Most of these plants, if they're growing in nature, wouldn't have perfect leaves. If you think about how easy some of these leaves rip when they're young, Guess what? In the jungle, there is nobody sitting there going, don't breathe on the plant. It will have issues. The leaf will not be perfect. It won't be perfect. That's fine. <laughs> These plants have survived for years out in the wild with predators, with um, as in like predators being animals, but also like bugs and pests and all of these things. So they're fine. They know what to do. And if a leaf isn't fully perfect, it's fine. I know there's people out there that go, but I'm buying this plant because I like the beautiful leaves. That's fine. And baby it if you must, basically. But at the same time, try not to lose sleep over it. It will save your sanity, trust me. So watering recommendations that I might have after growing these plants for a long period of time. And I'm going to be very blunt here. I don't think I'm growing any of my anthuriums in soil. Semi-hydro for me has been a game changer. It really has for this one. So because it gives it just the right amount of moisture level, I can then eventually put a, a catapo with some water, so a drip tray or water reservoir at the bottom, and it can suck up the water that it needs. Now, with anthuriums, I always say this, you can never have too much aeration going in. So these are aroid pots, and they do have large slits that are happening on the side. But a lot of my other pots are clear, and I will show you, they are clear pots, but I've kind of put holes in them so that I know that even more air is going through the plant. However, if you do this with something like a semi-hydro mix, you're going to need to potentially consider a, a water reservoir earlier because otherwise it will dry too quickly. So it's a fine balance with your anthuriums. And 
Always make sure I like with the Ethereum's because they can get root rot, I find some of them quite quickly. And especially if you're growing an Ethereum that you've never grown before or don't know anybody who has grown it, can't find an awful lot of information. I would highly, highly suggest getting something like a clear pot. And if you can't afford a, something like a clear pot, those disposable clear cups that you get for parties and things like that, obviously reuse them because single-use plastic is not good, but you probably will. Trust me, I've got so many like clear plastic cups that I'm kind of reusing everywhere here. Something that you can basically see the roots through because you want to be able to quickly at a glance go, oh, the anthurium is struggling. Like, am I getting crispy leaves? Is it gone? Like, has it got root rot? Taking it all out. And some anthuriums don't like their roots being fussed with too, too much. They might throw a bit of a hissy fit. So being able to quickly scan the pot and look at the roots is a good thing, basically. I'll come on to the point of water because I know somebody might ask this specific question. So people would be like, do you do anything specific to your water? No. I also found out very recently that I live in the area of the UK that has some of the hardest water around. So a lot of chalk and limestone or like calcium, I think. I don't know. Um, but it's really, really hard water, basically. So not ideal for a lot of plants. It's not the same as RO or reverse osmosis water or even rainwater. Every single one of my ethereums just gets regular water. Does it mean that occasionally I might get a bit of a yellow tip or a crispy tip? Yes. Do I care? No. <laughs> like ethereums can be a bit more challenging, not challenging necessarily, but something that you want to work towards and something you can really dive into and get to know and, and work your own way around it. But it's nowhere near as fussy as a lot of uh, the prayer plants or the calatheas and things like that, where it will go crispy really quickly if you give it even a hint of a bit of like extra chemicals in its water that isn't just pure rainwater that has gushed down from the heavens. No. And don't make your anthuriums that fussy. They don't have to be, basically. They are a lot more robust, at least in my experience, than a lot of the calatheas. It's just a different learning curve, basically, with those ones. But... That's one thing to, at least in my experience, it doesn't need specialist water, please, for all that is holy, because I've seen this. I used to see this more before. I don't think I see people that much doing it anymore. Do not buy bottled water for any of your plants. There's enough plastic out in the world, and they do not need Evian to grow. Trust me. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but with... The Anthurium, so obviously we talked about sections if you want to propagate via the pollination, but there is obviously the usual way of propagating them, which is just cutting off a chunk that has some error roots and putting it in. Usually a lot of people will do it in propagation boxes because it can kind of make sure that the humidity is in there. If you don't have that option, you can always do a clear plastic bag. It might look a bit janky, but it does the same thing as a propagation box. Just make sure that it gets some light. It doesn't need huge levels of light. Now, light is the other thing I want to talk about. So can you see this leaf here? And can you see these leaves here? Can you see the difference in color? This is getting blasted by the sun. This is looking internally at my conservatory, so it's getting less sun. A lot of the times with anthuriums, you need to make that decision as to what, how you want your plant to look. So for instance, this leaf is getting more light than this leaf was getting, and this one is a bit lighter than this leaf as well. So as, as long as you don't care, as long as it's getting bright and direct to medium light, you should be fine. These are not low light plants. Generally, that's a bit too low for them. But medium tends to be a place where a lot of people are quite happy to have them. Medium to bright indirect light is where they, when they like to have them. And in the real world, what the hell does that mean? It means don't have them right into a window, maybe have them slightly to the side so they're not getting bashed with the sun all day long, or maybe behind, so there's another plant in front of it and that one is behind. That will do a bit better. The thing that I will say, however, is looking at the leaves. Did this one grow super fast because it was getting loads of light? Yes. Is it lighter? Yes. Did this one grow slower because it's getting less light? And is it darker? Also yes. So. It's a bit of give and take with the anthuriums in terms of kind of what you're expecting to get out of them.
Humidity wise now, and this is an interesting topic because if you're looking at anthuriums that are kind of velvety, so like the queen anthurium, the quermans, they do appreciate slightly higher levels of humidity if you can give it to them. The anthuriums that are smoother, so I'm thinking of something like the anthurium esmeral dense, where it's got a very thick, leathery, kind of glossy leaf, they are less fussy, I find, with humidity levels, so that you don't need to be quite so exacting with them. So looking at some of the common issues that you might experience with anthurium, root rot is one, because again, that exacting nature of what they want their roots to be in is really, really specific, which is why I suggest using something like a clear pot. The other being humidity. Again, depending on whether or not you've got the more velvety leaves, you might want to give it slightly higher levels of humidity. If you cannot be bothered with that and you're not that fussed about velvety leaves, I would highly recommend try any of the anthuriums that have got the kind of glossy, non-velvety type leaves. You should be fine with those. The other thing is, and I don't know whether or not it's an issue or not, but some of these anthuriums can get absolutely ginormous. And let me show you a baby anthurium. So this is a seedling of an anthurium, two seedlings technically, of an anthurium cupulispathum. And I will add the name there at the top and hopefully I might be able to find a picture of a mature specimen <laughs> just so you can see how large it can get. So that is something that you do need to remember is that some very cute little anthurium that you're getting might not be cute and tiny for very much longer, basically. So that's something you need to bear in mind. And some anthuriums can be relatively fast growing. Then we'll come into something like mechanical damage. And we talked about that earlier on is those rips. And it usually will happen on the new baby leaves because they are so, so tiny. They are beautiful a lot of the time, though, because they come in and they tend to be different colors in like pinks and purples and kind of maroon colors. It, it's very exciting when you see those new leaves. Not all the time, but it is something that you kind of will look forward to seeing with a lot of your plants. It's the same time when you need to be watching out for pests because that's when the pest starts chomping away at those baby leaves. Even if you take it off, the damage might already be done and you won't see anything until that leaf's a lot larger. And you're just like, why has it got speckling? It's got no bugs. Yeah, but it did way back when. So something to bear in mind. And talking about something like the pollinations we were talking about, getting to grips with things like the sections and making sure that those sections can cross-pollinate successfully with each other, making sure that the watering that you're providing the plant is correct and it's getting that kind of balance that it needs, making sure that it's getting fertilizer. It doesn't need to be fertilized super, super often with anthuriums, I find a lot of the time but making sure that it's getting the right nutrition that it needs. I still use liquid gold leaf for most of my plants, but there's things that you might want to dive into and just have a little bit of a look at as well. And talking about what we were talking about a moment ago in terms of the propagation, pollination, and things like that, inflorescences. So for instance, with this anthurium here, there's an inflorescence. And normally you need to make decisions at that point is, are you going to pollinate that plant? If not, I would suggest as soon as you see an inflorescence coming in, and you might need to let it grow a bit, because a lot of the times when there's a new leaf that's emerging or there's a new inflorescence that's emerging, they can look quite similar in the beginning when you're first starting off and you don't even know the plant that well yet. So you might need to let the inflorescence grow a bit more. Cut it off because it takes an awful lot of energy for that plant to create that bloom and to go into that fertile stage which means it's not going to be growing that many leaves for you because it's focusing its energy on the flower. I know a lot of us, when it comes to a lot of our house plants, even with something like an anthurium that you've probably seen anthurium inflorescences hundreds of times if you've got loads of them, you might still want to see the first one. Fine, let it, let it bloom for the first one. Be aware that you might get a slightly less foliage, but then after that, if you really don't want to be cross-pollinating or doing anything along those lines, chop that inflorescence off and it will give your anthurium the best chance to get as many leaves as it possibly can because it can then focus on foliar growth and not focusing on growing blooms and becoming fertile essentially. Common pests again, and I always find this tricky to say common pests for all anthuriums, they're not the same for all anthuriums, it's going to be dependent on your plant. So for instance, my velvety leaf anthuriums 
generally tend to be the ones that might see spider mites on them. But spider mites generally, I find, at least in my experience, doesn't matter that it's an anthurium, it, as long as it's velvety, spider mites tend to like those plants. So keep an eye out for spider mites. Mealybugs I have found on several different anthuriums. Do they do an awful lot of damage? Not hugely so. I've also seen white fly behind some anthuriums. Does it do an awful lot of damage? Also no. Can you occasionally get thrips on juvenile leaves again? Even, even thrips, and I will hesitate, hesitate in saying this, don't always 100% like going onto mature anthurium leaves because they're that thick, basically, some of the thicker ones anyway. So thrips might be another one that you need to look at. But essentially, most pests that you will see on other houseplants will be the same ones that you'll see on your anthuriums. It's just depending on your type of anthurium and some of its characteristics will depend on what type of pests you see more of. But coming into kind of my overall views with this, with anthuriums, and I was very hesitant when I was starting off with anthuriums, has that changed now? Yes. I do thoroughly enjoy growing a lot of my anthuriums. I think a lot of people that have had collections for a while were very focused a lot of the times on the philodendrons, some of the monsteras. I'm thinking I'm seeing a bit of a shift now of people kind of getting a bit more into their anthuriums. And there is that kind of notion I find a lot of times when you get into anthuriums that you start going down that kind of hyper-focused route that a lot of the orchid growers, a lot of the orchid kind of aficionados go down. Because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that you can go into it. We talked about the sections, we talk about all these different things. That, blah, blah. But it is one of those things that if you really like getting into the nitty gritty of things, it's a great type of plant to kind of look into caring for. If you're really not that kind of person and you don't want to go through all this, can you still have anthuriums? Yes. Do I suggest maybe you go for the more straightforward ones like the crystallinums, the crinolinoviums, and they still give you those vibes? Yes. But unless you really, and some people might vehemently disagree with me, but because I know a lot of people wanted to get into their queen anthuriums. I would hazard a guess that a lot of people that didn't really want to baby their plants too much, they got their queen anthurium and might have had some issues and all of a sudden they are experts in all things anthuriums and everything to do with anthurium war queen and because they've had to do a lot of research to keep that specific plant happy. Correct? I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> but it is one of those things that if you really want to get into it, get into it basically. They're great plants to have. Uh, my thing now is I should have got them sooner. Yes, at the same time, no, because I didn't know enough or didn't have the patience or the willingness to do the research that was kind of needed to make sure that they are happy, basically. But in the grand scheme of things, they can be relatively straightforward as well. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.